Seeing Society by Eric Fromm. Chapter 9. Uh, summary and Conclusion. Man first emerged from the animal world as a freak of nature. Having lost most of the instinctive equipment which regulates the animal's activities, he was more helpless, less well-equipped for the fight for survival than most animals. Yet he had developed a capacity for thought, imagination, and self-awareness, which was the basis for transforming nature and himself. For many thousands of generations, man lived by food gathering and hunting. He was still tied to nature and afraid of being cast out from her. He identified himself with animals and worshipped these representatives of nature as his gods. After a long period of slow development, man began to cultivate the soil to create a new social and religious order based on agriculture and animal husbandry. During this period, he worshipped goddesses as the bearers of natural fertility, experienced himself as the child dependent on the fertility of the earth, on the life-giving breast of mother. At a time some 4,000 years ago, a decisive turn in man's history took place. He took a new step in the long drawn out process of his emergence from nature. He severed the ties with nature and with mother and set himself a new goal, that of being fully born, of being fully awake, of being fully human, of being free. Reason and conscience became the principles which were to guide him. His aim was a society bound by the bonds of brotherly love, justice, and truth. A new and truly human home to take the place of the irretrievably lost home in nature. And then again about 500 years before Christ and the great religious systems of India, Greece, Palestine, Persia, and China, the idea of the unity of mankind and of a unifying spiritual principle underlying all reality assumed new and more developed expressions. Lao Tse, Buddha, Isaiah, Heraclitus, and Socrates, an altar on Palestinian soil, Jesus and the Apostles, on American soil, Quetzalcoatl, and later again on Arabian soil, Mohammed, taught the ideas of the unity of man, of reason, love, and justice as the goals man must strive for. Northern Europe, Northern Europe seemed to sleep for a long time. Greek and Christian ideas were transmitted to its soil, and it took a thousand years before Europe was saturated with them. Around 1500 AD, a new period began. Man discovered nature and the individual. He laid the foundations for the natural sciences, which began to transform the face of the earth. The closed world of the Middle Ages collapsed. The unifying heaven broke up. Man found a new unifying principle in science and was searching for a new unity in the social and political unification of the earth and in the domination of nature. Moral conscience, the heritage of the Judeo-Christian tradition, and intellectual conscience, the heritage of the Greek tradition, fused and brought about a flowering of human creation as man had hardly ever known it before. Europe, the youngest child of humanity, culturally speaking, developed such wealth and such weapons that it became the master of the rest of the world for several hundred years. But again, in the middle of the 20th century, a drastic change is occurring, a change as great as ever occurred in the past. The new techniques replace the use of the physical energy of animals and men by that of steam, oil, and electricity. They create means of communication which transform the earth into the size of one continent, and the human race into one society where the fate of one group is the fate of all. They create marvels of devices which permit the best of art, literature, and music to be brought to every member of society. They create productive forces which will permit everybody to have a dignified material existence and reduces work to such dimensions that it will, only, that it will fill only a fraction of man's day. Yet today... When man seems to have reached the beginning of a new, richer, happier human era, his existence and that of the generations to follow is more threatened than ever. How is this possible? Man had won his freedom from clerical and secular authorities. He stood alone with his reason and his conscience as his only judges. But he was afraid of the newly won freedom. He had achieved freedom from without yet having achieved freedom to, to be himself, to be productive, to be fully awake. Thus he tried to escape from freedom. His very achievement, the mastery over nature, opened up the avenues for his escape. 
In building the new industrial machine, man became so absorbed in the new task that it became the paramount goal of his life. His energies, which once were devoted to the search for God and salvation, were now directed toward the domination of nature and ever-increasing material comfort. He ceased to use production as a means for a better life, but hypostasized it instead to an end in itself, an end to which life was subordinated. In the process of an ever-increasing division of labor, ever-increasing mechanization of work, and an ever-increasing size of social agglomerations, man himself became a part of the machine rather than its master. He experienced himself as a commodity, as an investment. His aim became to be a success. That is, to sell himself as profitably as possible on the market. His value as a person lies in his saleability, not in his human qualities of love, reason, or in his artistic capacities. Happiness becomes identical with consumption of newer and better commodities. The drinking in of music, screenplays, fun, sex, liquor, and cigarettes. Not having a sense of self except the one which conformity with the majority can give, he is insecure, anxious, depending on approval. He is alienated from himself, worships the product of his own hands, the leaders of his own making, as if they were above him rather than made by him. He is, in a sense, back where he was before the great human evolution began in the second millennium BC. He is incapable to love and to use his reason to make decisions, in fact incapable to appreciate life, and thus ready and even willing to destroy everything. The world is again fragment fragmentalized, has lost its unity. He is again worshipping diversified things with the only exception that now they are man-made rather than part of nature. The new era started with the idea of individual initiative. Indeed, the discoverers of new worlds and sea lanes in the 16th and 17th centuries, the pioneers of science, and the founders of new philosophies, the statesmen and philosophers of the great English, French, and American revolutions, and eventually the industrial pioneers and even the robber barons showed marvelous individual initiative. But with the bureaucratization and managerialization of capitalism, it is exactly the individual initiative that is disappearing. Bureaucracy has little initiative, that is, its nature, nor have automatons. The cry for individual initiative as an argument for capitalism is at best a nostalgic yearning, and at worst a deceitful slogan used against those plans for reform which are based on the idea of truly human individual initiative. Modern society has started out with the vision of creating a culture which would fulfill man's needs. It has, as its ideal, the harmony between the individual and social needs, the end of the conflict between human nature and the social order. One believed one would arrive at this goal in two ways, by the increased productive technique which permitted feeding everybody satisfactorily, and by a rational, objective picture of man and of his real needs. Putting it differently, the aim of the efforts of modern man was to create a sane society. More specifically, this meant a society whose members have developed their reason to that point of objectivity, which permits them to see themselves, others, nature in their true reality, and not distorted by infantile omni omniscience or paranoid hate. It meant a society whose members have developed to a point of independence, when they know the difference between good and evil, where they make their own choices, where they have convictions rather than opinions, faith rather than superstitions or nebulous hopes. It meant a society whose members have developed the capacity to love their children, their neighbors, all men themselves, all of nature, who can feel with one with all, yet retain their sense of individuality and integrity, who transcend nature by creating, not by destroying. So far we have failed. We have not bridged the gap between a minority which realized these goals and tried to live according to them, and the majority whose mentality is far back in the Stone Age in totism, toti, totemism and idol worship and feudalism. <clears throat> I lost my spot. Will the majority be converted to sanity, or will it use the greatest discoveries of human reason for its own purposes of unreason and insanity? Will we be able to create a vision of the good, sane life, which will stir the life forces of those afraid of marching forward? 
This time, mankind is at one crossroad where the wrong step could be the last step. In the middle of the 20th century, two great social colossi have developed, which, being afraid of each other, seek security in ever-increasing military rearmament. The United States and her allies are wealthier, their standard of living is higher, their interest in comfort and pleasure is greater than that of their rivals. The Soviet Union and her satellites and China, both rivals, claim that their system promises a final salvation for man, guarantees the paradise of the future. Both claim that the opponent represents the exact opposite to himself and that his system must be eradicated in the short or long run if mankind is to be saved. Both rivals speak in terms of 19th century ideals. The West in the name of the ideas of the French Revolution, of liberty, reason, individualism. The East in the name of the socialist ideas of solidarity, equality. They both succeed in capturing the imagination and the fanatical allegiance of hundreds of millions of people. There is today a decisive difference between the two systems. In the Western world, there is freedom to express ideas critical of the existing system. In the Soviet world, criticism and expression of different ideas is suppressed by brutal force. Hence, the Western world carries within itself the possibility for peaceful, progressive transformation, while in the Soviet world, such possibilities are almost non-existent. In the Western world, the life of the individual is free from the terror of imprisonment, torture, or death, which confront any member of the Soviet society who has not become a well-functioning automaton. Indeed, life in the Western world has been, and is even now sometimes as rich and joyous as it has ever been anywhere in human history. Life in the Soviet system can never be joyous, as indeed it can never be where the executioner watches behind the door. But without ignoring the tremendous differences between free capitalism and authoritarian communism today, it is short-sighted not to see the similarities, especially as they will develop in the future. Both systems are based on industrialization. Their goal is ever-increasing economic efficiency and wealth. They are sometimes run by a managerial class and by professional politicians. They both are thoroughly materialistic in their outlook, regardless of Christian ideology in the West and secular mess messianism in the East. They organize man in a centralized system, in large factories, political mass parties. Everybody is a cog in the machine and has to function smoothly. In the West, this is achieved by a method of psychological conditioning, mass suggestion, monetary rewards. In the East, by all this, plus the use of terror, it is to be assumed that the more the Soviet system develops economically, the less severely will it have to exploit the majority of the population. Hence, the more can terror be replaced by methods of psychological manipulation. The West develops rapidly in the direction of Huxley's Brave New World. The East is today's is today Orwell's 1984, but both systems tend to converge. What then are the prospects for the future? The first and perhaps most likely possibility is that of atomic war. The most likely outcome of such a war is the destruction of industrial civilization and the regression of the world to a primitive ag agrarian civilization, or agrarian level, sorry, or if the destruction should not prove to be as thorough as many specialists in the field believe, the result will be the necessity for the victor to organize and dominate the whole world. This could only happen in a centralized state based on force, and it would make little difference whether Moscow or Washington were the seat of government. But, unfortunately, even the avoidance of war alone does not promise a bright future. In the development of both capitalism and of communism as we can visualize them in the next 50 or 100 years, the process of atom atomization and alienation will proceed. Both systems are developing into managerial societies, their inhabitants well-fed, well-clad, having their wishes satisfied and not having wishes which cannot be satisfied. Automatons who follow without force, who are guided without leaders, who make machines which act like men and produce men who act like machines. Men whose reason deteriorates while their intel intelligence rises, thus creating the dangerous situation of equipping man with the greatest material power without the wisdom to use it. This alienation and automatization leads to an ever-increasing insanity, 
Life has no meaning. There is no joy, no faith, no reality. Everybody is happy, in quotation marks, except that he does not feel, does not reason, does not love. In the 19th century, the problem was that God is dead. In the 20th century, the problem is that man is dead. In the 19th century, inhumanity meant cruelty. In the 20th century, it means schizoid self-alienation. The danger of the past was that men became slaves. The danger of the future is that men may become robots. True enough, robots do not rebel. But given man's nature, robots cannot live and remain sane. They become golems. They will destroy their world and themselves because they cannot stand any longer the boredom of a meaningless life. Our dangers are war and ro robotism. What is the alternative? To get out of the rut in which we are moving and to take the next step in the birth and self-realization of humanity. The first condition is the abolishment of the war threat hanging over all of us now and paralyzing faith and initiative. We must take the responsibility for the life of all men and develop on an international scale what all great countries have developed internally, a relative sharing of wealth and a new and more just division of economic resources. This must lead eventually to forms of international economic cooperation and planning, to forms of world government and to complete disarmament. We must retain the industrial method, but we must decentralize work and state so as to give it human proportions and permit centralization only to an optimal point which is necessary because of the requirements of industry. In the economic sphere, we need co-management of all who work in an enterprise to permit their active and responsible participation. The new forms for such participation can be found in the political sphere, or it can be found. In the, in the political sphere, return to the town meetings by creating thousands of small face-to-face -face groups, which are well-informed, which discuss, and whose decisions are integrated in a new lower house. A cultural renaissance must combine work education for the young, adult edu education, and a new system of popular art and secular ritual throughout the whole nation. Our only alternative to the danger of robotism is humanistic communitarianism. The problem is not primarily the legal problem of property ownership, nor that of sharing profits. It is that of sharing work, sharing experience. Changes in ownership must be made to the extent to which they are necessary to create a community of work and to prevent the profit motive from directing production into socially harmful directions. Income must be equalized to the extent of giving everybody the material basis for a dignified life, and thus preventing the economic differences from creating a fundamentally different experience of life for various social classes. Man must be restituted to his supreme place in society, never being a means, never a thing to be used by others or by himself. Man's use by man must end, and economy must become the servant for the development of man. Capital must serve labor, things must serve life. Instead of the exploitative and hoarding orientation dominant in the 19th century and the receptive and marketing orientation dominant today, the productive orientation must be the end which all social arrangements serve. No change must be brought about by force. It must be a simultaneous one in the economic, political, and cultural spheres. Changes restricted to one sphere are destructive of every change, just as primitive man was helpless before natural forces, modern man is helpless before the social and economic forces created by himself. He worships the works of his own hands, bowing to the new idols, yet swearing by the name of the God who commanded him to destroy all idols. Man can protect himself from the consequences of his own madness only by creating a sane society which conforms with the needs of man, needs which are rooted in the very conditions of his existence. A society in which man relates to man lovingly, in which he is rooted in bonds of brotherliness and solidarity, rather than in the ties of blood and soil. A society which gives him the possibility of transcending nature by creating rather than, than by destroying. In which everyone gains a sense of self by experiencing himself as the subject of his powers, rather than by conformity. In which a system of orientation and devotion exists without man's needing to distort reality and to worship idols. Building such a society means taking the next step. It means the end of humanoid history, the phase in which man had not become fully human. It does not mean the end of days, the completion, the state of perfect harmony, in which no conflicts 
or problems confront them. On the contrary, it is man's fate that his existence is beset by contradictions, which he has to solve without ever solving them. When he has overcome the primitive state of human sacrifice, be it in the ritualistic form of the Aztecs or in the secular form of war, when he has been able to regulate his relationship with nature reasonably instead of blindly, when things have truly become his servants rather than his idols, he will be confronted with the truly human conflicts and problems. He will have to be adventuresome, courageous, imaginative, capable of suffering and of joy, but his powers will be in the service of life and not in the service of death. The new phase of human history, if it comes to pass, will be a new beginning, not an end. Man today is confronted with the most fundamental choice, not that between capitalism or communism, but that between robotism, of both the capitalist and the communist variety, or humanistic communitarian socialism. Most facts seem to indicate that he is choosing robotism, and that means in the long run insanity and destruction. But all these facts are not strong enough to destroy faith in man's reason, goodwill, and sanity. As long as we can think of other alternatives, we are not lost. As long as we can consult together and plan together, we can hope. But indeed, the shadows are lengthening. The voices of insanity are becoming louder. We are in reaching of achieving a state of humanity, which corresponds to the vision of our great teachers. Yet we are in danger of the destruction of all civilization, or of robotization. A small tribe was told thousands of years ago, I put before you life and death, blessing and curse, and you choose life. This is our choice too.